our next speaker will be um, Dr. John Schumann. Uh, John has been president of Oklahoma University Tulsa School of Community Medicine since 2015, and there holds the Gusman Endowed Chair in Internal Medicine. Um, John completed the McLean Ethics Fellowship uh, in the 2002-2003 year, and then stayed on our faculty for many years. Um, indeed, for many years, uh, John Schumann was the doctor to whom I signed out whenever I was out of town. And um, I still, I can't do it now that he's down in Oklahoma. Um, John's scholarly work includes research and advocacy on the ethics of profit-driven commercial screening tests, on social determinants of health, as well as on analyses of patients that leave the hospital, quote, against medical advice. Dr. Schumann has authored the weekly blog, Glass Hospital, since 2010, a blog that aims at demystifying medicine for lay audiences. Today, uh, John will give a talk entitled, Eugenic Shadows in the CRISPR Age. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. John Schumann. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. And um, it's just so great to be back in Chicago. And um, my thanks to Mark and Anna. And I can't believe it's the 30th year. Um, that's really a milestone, so mazel tov. And also my thanks to the board and Rachel Kohler and to the associate directors of the McLean Center. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit just about how I came up with this topic, but that will be woven into um, today's talk. So um, yeah, I'm going to describe the scope and scale of CRISPR. Um, but not too much. Mostly what I'm going to talk about is eugenics and then how I think there are these whispers of eugenics in CRISPR and how we have to be careful. And I think people are actually thinking a lot about this. That's kind of my conclusion, I'll tell you at the outset, is that people are thinking about this avidly. So um, if you follow the popular press, which I do a lot, um, you'll see all kinds of stuff about CRISPR and gene, gene editing technology in uh, nearly every magazine or publication that you come across because it has truly moved from the realm of science fiction into science. And so we're just seeing headlines constantly about gene splicing, gene editing, the ability to correct uh, hereditary um, diseases and conditions. But certainly there's this fear that we can make germline edits and then thus alter um, out of humanity really some of these genetic defects. So here's my CRISPR slide for, um, say it with me now, clustered, um, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. That, that's what CRISPR actually stands for. It's very hard to remember. So it's easy to say CRISPR. And um, this one picture shows you, um, a lot of people call CRISPR-Cas9 or Cas9 the enzyme as the so-called molecular scissors that cuts out the um, matched sequence. But what I like to, this cartoon I like, um, actually from chemical and engineering news, which I do not uh, read uh, regularly. Um, but uh, it, I call it the toothbrush. You can see the purple tongs of the toothbrush with the, kind of the squiggly line. And what that is is a, a, a um, segment of RNA that goes in. It has these matched um, base sequences that match a targeted sequence of DNA. And then the Cas9 is kind of the blue cloud around the picture that's the enzyme that allows the targeted sequence to be cleaved. And therein lies the rub, and so you're able to then actually edit out or, a second step, replace uh, a segment of DNA. And that uh, is really changed, really, the whole game. Um, so, like I said, a lot of people are thinking about this. And this was the National Academies put out this, uh, this volume in uh, 2017 based on a meeting that took place in 2015 in Washington. And, um, like I said, you'll see this a lot in the popular press. So this was Joe Biden. Um, uh, this is from 2016, back looking at the cancer moonshot. And so there's, there actually is, to my best of my research, one ongoing cancer clinical trial in the US. But there are many, many that are going on in China. But these were the, the summary of recommendations from the 2015, um, uh, 2015 conference on gene editing, uh, essentially with some 
cautionary, you know, basically that this process is okay in uh, somatic cells. So not in, uh, sounds like we got that back on, <laughs> um, in somatic cells, not in uh, germline cells. We have to permit clinical research trials only for compelling purposes in heritable um, cells and that ongoing reassessment and public participation should precede any heritable germline editing. And then there's this whole idea of enhancement, right? So that's where you kind of get into the eugenics ideas. Well, geez, I, I wouldn't mind being a little bit taller. I wouldn't mind being a lot smarter um, and probably being maybe slightly more athletic. So if I could just have my genes edited, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be great? Well, you know, it doesn't take a, a big leap to think of ways in which this could be used for more nefarious purposes. So this was a tweet that came out of the uh, very recent, last month, American Society of Human Genetics. Um, where uh, this, this one scientist just tweeted what was going on just in kind of the popular arena around um, genetics. Um, and so he mentioned a senator taking a DNA test. Um, major parts of the United States can be under genetic surveillance via these direct-to-consumer tests. I think what he's referring to there is the 23andMe that was used to solve that Golden State killer crime. Well, it just so happens that this month of the McLean 30th Annual, 30th annual, uh, annual Conference, the second international summit on human genome editing will be taking place later this month in Hong Kong. Um, and so um, registration is closing soon. So you, operators are standing by if you want to call. But so um, in other words, this is an ongoing dialogue. I, I guess it's at least at this first set of meetings on a somewhat of a triennial basis. And so um, they're looking to, I guess, codify or work forward because there certainly has been a lot going on. So this is a postdoctoral fellow, Yang Yang Cheng, who uh, works at Cornell, but he's a Chinese national. And he wrote this opinion piece in foreign policy saying China will always be bad at bioethics. And he makes the argument that, culturally speaking, that Chinese have a different standard for uh, allowing this kind of experimentation because the stigma of heredi hereditary disease is much greater in China and they're much more willing to take risks. Of course, um, in China, science that is approved by the Chinese Communist Party is considered much more valid um, than science that is, doesn't have the Communist Party seal of approval. And so therein lies how politics can often influence science. Um, this was from this year, um, uh, an article on NPR, Doctors in China, Lead Race to Treat Cancer by Editing Genes. And this man, <laughs> his name is um, Xiaorong Deng, and he is um, getting, um, he is getting cells T cells actually, altered T cells to treat his esophageal cancer. This was his second treatment. And various commentators quoted in this article um, said things that the, the investigator in China actually um, said that it was very easy to get approval to, con to conduct this clinical trial. Um, but there were some American ethical commentators saying things like, there's just so much we don't know about CRISPR technology that we really need to go slow and we're not ready for prime time yet. So this was kind of the journey of how I came to this topic. You know, the, you get a, um, asked to speak pretty far in advance. And so um, I had just gone to, um, there's a, a, a museum in Tulsa called the Sherwin Miller Museum of Judaica. And they have a small um, sort of permanent exhibit on the Holocaust. And they had this traveling show from the United States Holocaust Museum, Deadly Medicine, Creating the Master Race. And it was a fairly small exhibit because it's traveling and it goes on from place to place every month. And um, what really haunted me about this certainly was the history of experimentation of the Nazi doctors on unwilling subjects. But um, I was left with one of the final ex installations in the exhibit. It was a, about a dozen photographs of what I would call second and third tier physicians and scientists who participated in the kind of Nazi medical industry on experimentation and unwilling subjects who just kind of after World War II just sort of went back to their, you know, you, you, you sort of know about Joseph Mengele and the notorious people who kind of fled the country and went into exile and were eventually caught uh, and tried at the Nuremberg trials. Um, but th there were these, like I say, second and third tier scientists and doctors who just went back to the university positions uh, in regular life. And so it, it sort of haunted me and I thought about it for a long time and thought, geez, what, you know, what does it mean when sort of the um, prevalent political ideology influences your science and you're willing to sort of be compromised? Um, and so here's a photograph, famous photograph from the Nazi doctor's trial or the so-called Nazi doctor's trial. So I came across this book by Carl Zimmer, who's, a, who's an excellent science journalist. And um, it's, a, it's a kind of a heavy tome, but it's really very good. I'd highly recommend it. And there was this particular chapter kind of on the history of American eugenics. And um, it's really a, an idea that was sort of, I mean, it started obviously in sort of agriculture and, and um, botany and into farming. Um, and there was 
the term was actually coined in the UK by Francis Galton, who was actually Charles Darwin's cousin. Who knew that? The term eugenics. And eugenics is really this idea of selecting for better offspring or, or making the human race uh, more um, successful. And so um, what's interesting is the idea kind of crossed the pond and, and it, it got a strong hold here in the United States um, and then ultimately was adopted even after being somewhat discredited in the United States by um, the Nazi party. And so I'm just going to share with you this one chapter because I thought it was so interesting. Um, basically, there was a guy, so there was um, this school um, called the Vineland Training School in Vineland, New Jersey in the Pine Barrens that was created in the late, very late 1800s, almost around 1900. And it originally went by the name of the New Jersey Home for the Education and Care of Feeble-Minded Children. And it sounds so archaic um, and is you know, kind of funny to us, I think, but feeble-mindedness was definitely a term that was used back then uh, to describe people with intellectual impairments, disabilities, and, and what we would, you know, now Down syndrome would be included in that um, category. And in this chapter, he takes us through a story of a uh, woman named Emma Wolverton who was um, sort of delivered, was abandoned by her family, and uh, came into the violent school at the, the age of eight. And she quickly, well, a few years later, um, was uh, tested by a guy named Henry Goddard, who was a name that was not familiar to me. He started as the director of research at the Vineland Training School in 1906. And he um, was very interested early on in the marriage of psychology and education. And so he became an early advocate of intelligence testing. And we had no good way to test intelligence in students. And so he actually went to Europe and found out what, what science was going on there. And he, he was the first one to bring back the Binet intelligence test to the United States and translate it. And he found, and again, they didn't know what the innate factors, the so-called hereditary factors of intelligence were that could be carried on through generations or feeble-mindedness that could be carried on. That was really what they were trying to root out, essentially. But the Binet test was at least useful in clustering people and was repeatable. And so he came up with this schema um, of feeble-mindedness. So feeble-minded people under the age of three were officially labeled as idiots. And I, I always knew there was some kind of history to this, but I never knew this before I, I read this. Um, imbeciles were those with low IQs between ages three and seven. And Goddard is actually known for creating the term moron from Greek. And morons were, um, it was Greek for fool, and those were people that had an intellectual age of eight to 12. And like uh, any good medical thing, it had mild, moderate, and severe uh, degrees. So um, in 1909, as he progressed through his research job, he started to join these national committees on things like the el elimination of feeble-mindedness. Um, and he wrote a manifesto about that. And he's probably most famous or infamous for in 1912 writing a book called The Kalakak Family. And Kalakak was a Greek neologism that he put together, kalos meaning good and kakos meaning bad. And so he, it was a pseudonym of Emma Wolverton who um, he, he gave the pseudonym Deborah Kalakak, and it was really a story about her family. And he had this army of researchers that went out and essentially confirmed the hypothesis that she came from a family of feeble-minded people and that had been repeated through generations. Subsequently, this all was debunked, and it turned out that the research was really spurious and was eventually disavowed. But Goddard became so popular from this book, which was a bestseller, that he went on to be hired by the New York City schools to um, apply the Binet testing to kids in New York City public schools. Then the United States Public Health Service hired him to then test immigrants. Um, and the whole idea of we didn't want to let feeble-minded immigrants into the United States. And I'll just read you one thing that was kind of shocking to me, was that his staff at Ellis Island broke down the results of testing by ethnic group. 79% of Italians were feeble-minded, 83% of Jews, and 87% of Russians. So here we were, in theory, letting all these feeble-minded immigrants into our country. And so this fed the wave of anti-immigration fervor. And all I could think was, wow, I hear these overtones of these kinds of things now. Um, further, he went on to test the um, World War I was about to start. And so the United States Army contracted with him to test soldiers. And so um, when he tested soldiers, 47% of white soldiers and 89% of blacks were categorized as morons. It did not speak very highly of our armed forces. But even Goddard himself criticized the methodology and went back and he loosened, uh, he loosened the definition of feeble-minded or moron. And still then, about 40% of folks in the military overall were um, considered to be of low intelligence. So um, you can see right away that um, the, the normal bell curve didn't necessarily even apply. So um, 
he went on, World War I basically abruptly ended his career. He no longer was at the Vineland School, and um, he wound up going, moving to Ohio where he worked on, he actually did some good things in his career, including um, advocating for um, inter, um, individualized education programs for people with intellectual impairments, also saying that um, uh, perpetrators of crimes who had limited ability couldn't necessarily um, have, have committed their crimes in a premeditated fashion. Um, but interestingly, while in prison in 1924, Hitler read a version of the Kalakak family. And so that was kind of, many people, historians think, that was where he at least fed his ideas about eugenics and the Aryan race and superiority. And it wasn't far from there to the um, Nazi laws on uh, uh, racial hygiene. So um, that was just all very interesting and kind of haunting. And so, I, I, you know, history always has this way of repeating itself. And I thought this, you know, certainly was a dark chapter in American history and something that, you know, we, we tend to gloss over or talk about the eugenics movement in very short kind of two-sentence phrases. And so kind of getting into it in this sort of deeper scientific way was pretty interesting. Well, now fast forward back to the future. This is um, an article from just a month ago in the Wall Street Journal. And this is actually about using CRISPR to gene edit different species. You can't probably see it, but this is supposed to be the passenger pigeon inside of a glass terrarium that's broken out because there's this whole, it turns out, this whole movement to bring back passenger pigeons by splicing the germ cells of kind of common pigeons with DNA from passenger pigeons from bones and other artifacts we have of them to create a new species of passenger pigeons. Same is true for the woolly mammoth. There's a whole book um, called Woolly and George Church at Harvard, who I have a picture of here at the um, low, lower right, is very involved in this and is one of the patent holders on a lot of the CRISPR technology. Interestingly, the two uh, most well-known scientists for um, CRISPR-Cas9 and inventors are uh, on the left, Emmanuel Charpentier from France, who actually works in Berlin at the Max Planck Institute, and Jennifer Doudna from Berkeley. And I think it's great that these women, and they have been foremost among calls for restraint in terms of using this new, understanding its power and limiting its use in germline technology. So um, again, it brings us back to today, and you don't, you can, not a day goes by where you don't see an article about um, I would say, in terms of the science news, the popular news about gene uh, science or technology, but um, it certainly has spilled over into our politics. And so just last month when Elizabeth Warren did, used her 23andMe test to essentially, I think, try to confirm that she had some Cherokee heritage, this did not go over well, really on either side of the political aisle. Many Native Americans decried her attempt to do this. Um, and, and certainly many scientists said that using a 23andMe to talk about your heredity is actually not the right way to do it. And then there was this story last month in the Times about how white supremacists or white nationalists are using genetics to essentially uh, claim genetic superiority, that is by having the lactase enzyme um, into adulthood and th the ability to drink milk. And so there are these online videos, and it was in this article actually of white nationalists you know, chugging milk, essentially saying that they're racially superior. Ironically, it turns out that that gene, when it's traced, goes back to East Africa and African farmers along the savannah. So that gene, wherever it originated from, happened to come from Africa. So I don't know if um, the white supremacists um, have their, their science straight. It's probably not a big surprise. <laughs> but um, why geneticists are alarmed? It turns out that the folks at this, a this American Society of Genetics meeting um, had a, a very hard time sort of disavowing some of this because they, I guess they're finding that it's hard to explain some of this science. And so they're being very reticent to try to, it's par partially they don't want to be politicized. And so um, this letter from Robert Pollack, who is an esteemed um, biologist at Columbia, used to be the dean of Columbia, um, wrote about eugenics uh, lurking in the shadow of CRISPR. And this is kind of what brought it home for me. Um, was just that he essentially calls for an outright ban on germline modification um, using CRISPR technology to, to um, alter the germline because we essentially don't know what we're going to get, all of the unintended consequences. Um, nevertheless, and I, you know, I told you that this, this international conference is going to go forward um, later this month, um, I fully expect to see these things continue to progress and especially we'll continue to hear these stories of what I would you know, hasten to say are positive stories of bringing back animals from extinction or certainly cures for uncommon uh, diseases, be they hereditary or acquired. Um, but anyway, thank you for your attention. And that was kind of my journey with one minute to go. So if you have questions, I'd be happy to, happy to listen to you. Well, 
Uh, hello, my name is Yu Liangzhao. I'm from West China Hospital. I want to make some comments on the CRISPR technique uh, because, uh, as you mentioned, China is uh, playing a leading role in the uh, CRISPR technique in treating cancers, etc. And uh, one of the most uh, very early human trial uh, is conducted in my hospital, and uh, it is in the oncology department, leading by Professor Lu Yu. And they use CRISPR uh, technique to modify the immune cells and uh, uh, inject it back to the uh, uh, patients diagnosed with late stage uh, metastatic uh, non-small cell can uh, lung cancer. Uh, and uh, they, they claim that they were the first uh, human trial in the world. And, uh, uh, although there is um, research uh, in the States called Sean Park or some, uh, some, uh, or some uh, who is also uh, intend to do this research. Uh, what I want to say is that um, the Chinese scientists hold a comparatively open attitude to the uh, CRISPR technique because the chi China has a so large um, cancer population and uh, we just uh, in bad need for a new technique. Uh, but uh, the leading un university hospitals doing these kind of trials, they follow really very strict uh, protocols which is compliant to the uh, med medical ethics com uh, principles. They register their protocols within the uh, international registries. Actually, I, if I didn't uh, remember it wrong, it's, it's, they register in uh, U American uh, registry database. So uh, every step, every step, uh, step of their research will be under the monitor uh, in a st international standards and uh, they follow really strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. So uh, uh, I think the medical ethics uh, will not be a large issue. And I think all of us uh, should have an open attitude towards these new technologies so because they will just uh, benefit the whole human beings. So no matter if it's uh, USA or uh, China, so uh, as long as the medical issues and other things were taken good care of, we should be open to that. Thank you. So, John, thanks for that talk. I just want to correct one misstatement. Yeah. Uh, it's not 23andMe. Um, actually, in order, it's not 23andMe that was used for the criminal uh, investigations. It was something called GED Match which you can upload your own genetic information and it specifically says, I, get, I agree it's in fine print, but it specifically says this is open source and can be used by anyone, including criminal prosecutions. Um, 23andMe and, and Ancestry.com do not have that. They do say that it's private and so it can't be opened and that if the police actually wanted to use 23andMe or Ancestry.com, they'd have to get a new sample, they'd have to get permission, and they'd have to upload it that way. So for those of you who have put your samples up on 23andMe and Ancestry.com, it's still relatively private, private to the extent that it's been bought and sold by um, for-profit companies, but it's not being used by the police. That is actually GED Match, which specifically states permission to share with everyone and anyone. Thank you for clarifying that. A lot of comments. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. <laughs>